So 2014 is almost drawn to a close, so it's time to count down my top 10 for this year. Now, obviously this list is only going to be limited to games I've actually played, and I like to think it'll be a bit different compared to the other lists you'll see out there. Um, but not to put a downer on this year, but it's not exactly been the greatest year for gaming. It's kind of been the year of the remaster. I mean, some better than others, and one of them might even be on this list. And we've had games that just haven't lived up to their expectations, you know, thanks to developers lying, showing fake footage, and just outright incompetence. But more on that in the top 10 worst list, which should come quite soon. But anyway, for now, please enjoy this top 10 of 2014. Number 10. Number 10 goes to Fantasy Life on the 3DS. Now I'm a big fan of live sim games and RPGs, so Fantasy Life seemed like the perfect game for me. The game has 12 different professions which you can switch freely between, and each one complements each other in some way. For example, if I'm a hunter I can collect a lot of meat from kills, I can then switch to the cooking profession to cook it. Another example is if I'm a woodcutter I can collect wood and then switch to the carpenter profession to make furniture for my house, and you get the idea. You don't have to keep switching back and forth between professions, which is a good idea, since once you've learnt the skills you can use them no matter your chosen profession. You just get an XP bonus if you're using that profession's skills. The combat and crafting elements aren't deep at all. Crafting is just a bunch of quick time events and combat is quite simple, but this works well for a handheld game where you just want to have a quick session whilst on the bus or something like that. There is a lot to do here, especially if you want to max out each profession. It becomes very addictive trying to get to the next level in your carpentry profession just to get some sweet new furniture for your house. You definitely get into that just five more minutes mentality. The story's crap, so don't play the game expecting some deep storytelling, but it's a damn charming fun game. Number 9 Mario Kart 8. Yeah, it's a casual game, but there's no denying that Mario Kart 8 is fun. Not to mention its great visuals and 60 frames a second action for smoky smooth racing. A great variety of tracks, weapons, kart parts and characters as well. Too many Cooper kids though. It's super polished as well, no bugs, glitches, frame drops or anything like that. It's a real showcase of Nintendo's passion for quality. It refines and polishes what was in the previous Mario Kart games. There is some of the random luck element that can spoil the game a bit. Getting hit with a blue shell right before you cross the line can just make you say fuck it and put the game down, but those moments seem fewer in this iteration. The new anti-gravity racing adds some new mechanics, such as boosting off other racers, but it also produces some neat visual effects. Seeing tracks and other racers from upside down is a nice little touch. The multiplayer, both online and local, works pretty much perfectly. I didn't experience any lag whilst playing, the only minus really is playing with over two players in local co-op drops the frame rate to 30 frames a second, but it's still totally playable. Overall it balances the old and the new elements of Mario Kart in a satisfying way, and it's the best one in a long time, though if you're not a fan this probably isn't going to sway you. Number 8 Bravely Default. Now this did release in the UK in late December last year, but it came out in 2014 in the US and I didn't play it until this year, so it's gonna go in. It's a cracking little handheld JRPG that mixes elements of old school JRPGs like Final Fantasy VI and adds some new modern elements. The story isn't very interesting, you've seen it all before, but the four main characters are very nicely rounded, but the battle and job system is really where the game shines. Your characters can switch between any class they like at any time. Throughout the game you'll unlock new classes is by progressing the story and doing side quests, which are equally as good as the main narrative. The classes determine what skills your character will unlock and how their stats will rise and what equipment is best for them. You can use some secondary skills as well, for example I might use the white mage's healing skill with my knight just for that extra bit of healing power, so it's a really deep system that can bring out some really interesting combinations. The combat at first feels like a traditional turn based system, but there will be two commands that you're not used to seeing, brave and default. Brave allows you to take multiple actions up to five in one turn, but you'll have to wait five of that character's turns again to act. Default lets you store an action and defend at the same time, this can be done up to five times as well, and the boss fights really make use of this clever mechanic. It'll be a great throwback for old school JRPG fans, but it's interesting mechanics will get any RPG fan hooked. Number seven. Earth Defense Force. I'm pretty sure when they designed this game it started with just fun, written in block capitals in the middle of a sheet of paper and went from there. 
The game looks like shit and the frame rate hits PowerPoint levels of slow, but look at this madness. Every level just boils down to shoot the huge horde of enemies coming for you. But it does it so well it's all you want and it's just outright mental. For example, is that building in your way? Launch a few rockets at it and bang, problem solved. Did your rocket miss and hit the allied soldier right between the eyes and now his body's somewhere on the other side of the city? Don't worry, the game doesn't care. There's four different classes in the game, all of which play extremely differently from one another. There's also an insane variety of weapons and enemies, so even though the game's combat remains similar throughout, you still have plenty of surprises waiting around the corner. It also has a charming B-movie style to it. The voice acting is on purposely cheesy, at least I hope it is anyway, and your allies constantly talk about the girlfriends and families back home just before being eaten by a giant ant. It's simple but damn effective, a big dumb shooter, and you owe it yourself to play this game. Number six. Oddworld new and tasty. This is how remakes are done, not like somewhere they up the resolution a bit, don't bother testing its stability then chucking it out the window. I mean I love the original Oddworld on the PS1 but we can all admit that it's not aged that gracefully. The gameplay has been improved to make the game less frustrating than the original, with a much improved checkpoint system and quick save. The controls are a lot smoother, Abe has a lot more finesse to his movements, the game is still challenging though, plenty of trial and error goes on and once you nail a tricky section it feels really satisfying. The story is the same as the original PlayStation version and still has its dark sense of humour. And it looks superb, it animates beautifully and the lighting is great. And the sparse voice acting that's in the game is well done as well. If you're a fan of the original then have no fear, this makes Oddworld feel new again. I could go on but I feel like I'd be repeating everything from my review that's on this channel. So if you want to find out more, please go and watch that. Number 5 Alien Isolation since the AAA game industry will tell you that survival horror is dead, it's great to see this game come out and call out the industry's bullshit and become one of the best games of the year. A great PC port as well, it's genuinely terrifying and a massive love letter to Alien fans. Creative Assembly nailed the atmosphere of the Alien films and made the Alien a terrifying beast again, much like the original Alien mover. What set Alien Isolation apart for me though is its non-scripted scares. For example, when you play Fear, the scares happen at the exact same point each time time, so when you replay it, you know where they're coming from. But in Alien Isolation, the AI for the alien is completely random. He might take to the vents, crawl on the ceiling or patrol the floor and lockers. It's not completely random though, it'll always be near you, but that keeps the tension high. It'd be a pretty boring game if the alien fucked off to the other half of the ship for most of the game. Human encounters are quite good as well, since humans react differently to your presence. Some might let you walk by or talk with them, others might point their guns at you and tell you to fuck off, and others might just open fire at the mere sight of you, which will obviously attract the alien for its dindins. And then there's the androids who appear later in the game, who can be arguably scarier than the alien. A bit of a slow burn at the start, but it's an absolute legit survival horror experience. It can drag on a bit too long towards the end, it's a 20 hourish game though, so you get a good content to price ratio. Number 4 Persona Q Shadow of the Labyrinth Persona 3 and 4 are two of the best JRPGs ever made. I would even go as far as saying that they're two of the best games ever made. And upon hearing that there was going to be a spin-off starring the cast of both of these games, excitement hit. What you get is a pure hard as nails dungeon crawling experience. Apparently this game is very similar to the Etrian Odyssey series, which I haven't played, but I probably will now if this game's anything to go by. You can draw your own map on the bottom screen of the 3DS and mark where doors, treasure chests and other things are. Combat will be familiar to anyone who's played a Persona game. The way to succeed is to exploit your enemy's weaknesses. In Persona 3 and 4 you would get an extra turn if you hit the enemy's weakness, but in Persona Q you enter a boosted state where you can use any of your abilities without draining your HP or MP, however getting hit removes this. An absolutely great soundtrack as well, but that's to be expected of a Persona game. The battle theme is permanently stuck in my head. A great Persona fan love letter and a smashing RPG overall. Number 3 Dragon Age Inquisition. For people who want a game with a good content to price ratio, you really can't go wrong here. There's so much to do if you want it. The story is lengthy with some great moments and it doesn't hurt that it's well written as well. Plus there is an absolute ton of side quests. While some are a bit boring, they do offer some decent rewards and are completely relevant. You'll be tripping over these side quests every minute. The combat is a mix between Dragon Age Origins and Dragon Age 2s, but I'd have liked it to have leaned more towards Origins tactical focused combat, but we can't have everything. Characters all have many different skill trees, abilities and specialisations. Plus, you can even customise the AI to behave how you want, even if it doesn't work most of the time. So there is an insane amount of customisation. 
it's just Inquisition's world is just so absorbing. You'll explore the lands trying to build up the Inquisition's power and influence and suddenly you'll look at the clock and realise you should have gone to bed hours ago. The sense of scale is amazing as well. You really feel like you're working to save a world about to destroy itself. It's clear that Bioware have taken all the criticisms on board. Most of the gripes I've had with this series are completely gone now and I can't wait to see what Bioware do next. Number two. Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor Another great PC port, Shadow of Mordor is a strange beast. Pretty much every element you see in this game is borrowed from another franchise. The combat is ripped straight from the Batman Arkham games and the movement system straight from Assassin's Creed. Now those two systems work well but it's Shadow of Mordor's one and really only original element that makes it shine and that's the Nemesis system. What makes this system great is that everyone will have their own rivalries and stories to tell. I mean for me there was this one guy called Ronk of Spider so I defeated it about six times by stabbing him in the face and he got the better of me a couple of times as well but he just kept coming back looking for more whilst at the same time he was getting more and more deformed each time with metal implants and stitches in his face towards the end all he had was just a bag over his head finally though i pushed him into a fire and cut his head off so i'd like to see him come back from that you really do get to hold grudges against these orcs if one of them defeats you and calls you a puff then advances through the orc ranks you will hunt him down to the end of the earth it's just such a fresh, great, enjoyable mechanic. The combat system also evolves as you play, keeping a nice pace going. Later on in the game you can mind control orcs, including the higher ranking officers. You can send them to duel another orc, then swoop in and finish off the winner. There's just so many cool little things you can do with the game's mechanics and it rightfully earns the number 2 spot. <laughs> South Park The Stick of Truth Admittedly the number 1 and 2 spot were really heavily contended, but South Park The Stick of Truth, judging by previous South Park games and licensed games in general, should have been crap. With the game changing developers and being delayed quite a few times, South Park had the odds stacked against it really heavily, and it really looked like it would never see a release, but it did, and it's an amazing surprise. And you know what as well, we rarely see comedy games anymore, and when we do they're not funny. Sunset Overdrive. And South Park thankfully is not only funny, but a great RPG as well. The game isn't as long as say Dragon Age, not by a long shot, but for South Park it works, as I think it would have outstayed its welcome after the 15 or so hours it takes to complete it. The combat is a traditional turn-based system with time button presses to block and time attacks for maximum damage. You can use a potion or a character's signature ability before you attack, so it can be a bit easy even on the highest difficulty. Especially when you attach a few weapon strap-ons, you can really start wrecking the enemies. The side quests in the game are some of the best I've ever seen as well. All of them are really flushed out and have really good references to the show, and all of them have funny scenes and relevant, useful rewards for completing them, like summons and weapons. As you can tell by looking at the footage, it looks exactly like an episode of the show as well, so aesthetically it looks amazing. You can tell when you're playing it that the Stick of Truth had a lot of passion put into it. All the people working on it clearly cared about making a game that was true to the show, as well as a damn good game, and that's why it's my personal game of the year. Happy New Year and thanks for watching. If you like what you're seeing here, please don't hesitate to like and subscribe. It helps out massively. Also, there's two videos just here for you to check out. One's a retrospective on Silent Hill and the other's a review on Dino Crisis for the PS1. Again, thanks for watching.